uh, set up. So welcome everybody to Physics uh, 4411 in the spring semester 2023. What I wanted to do, I mean, in the first uh, hour here, I mean, the first lecture, is to give you a kind of overview of what we plan to do. Now, the uh, uh, lectures will mainly be via Zoom. And if you look into the schedule here, uh, and also the messages which we put, there is a link to, uh, if you click on here, there's a Zoom link for the semester and the lab sessions. So if you go on the normal schedule here, uh, this is the uh, standard link which we are going to use again and again. And uh, we are going to use that link both for the uh, lectures and the lab sessions. Now, the lab sessions uh, will also be physical in person, in the, and Ivan will be the one who uh, tends to the uh, in person lab, which is from uh, four o'clock till seven o'clock in the afternoons on, on Thursdays. And we will have lecture sessions in the uh, in the set in, in in from from two o'clock till four o'clock so the lectures will mainly be uh, via zoom but then the lab will be both in person and via zoom uh, could you please just switch off the uh, the uh, or just unmute it? i see there's somebody who has a uh, okay i just um, i just muted you here so the um, uh, Except for the period from uh, in March 6 to uh, 10, we may have uh, in person lectures. So that's why I didn't put in a digital session here. And we may also run uh, some kind of more intensive lectures because I will be in present at the University of Oslo uh, from March 6 to March 10. So a little bit about the uh, the basics. So this is the uh, the standard uh, UIO page, the official page for the course for this semester. And you will also find the weekly messages. And these will also be sent to you via email. And so that every uh, end of the week, you will get an update and with plans for next week. Let me just go back to the uh, basic setup, which we have. And if you if you scroll down here, you will find the links to the GitHub address, which contains all the teaching material. The uh, there's a link to a uh, kind of textbook which I'm uh, wrapping up on computational quantum mechanics, and then there's also a link to the to the weekly lectures. But let's take a quick look at what these links look like. So if you if you go to the basic uh, GitHub address, what you will find then is simply just a uh, brief discussion in the README here. Or what the course is about, some learning outcomes, prerequisites, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, in information about the instructors, uh, my email address, Owen's email address, and if you click on uh, the doc folder, you will also find if you go to this uh, pub folder, you will find the uh, links to uh, the weekly teaching material, uh, either in HTML format or as a Jupyter notebook or as a uh, PDF file. Uh, the source for the files is actually in this SRC folder. You will find the different projects we are going to work on under the folder projects. So if you go into 2023, you will find the first draft for project number one. Uh, you will find some links to relevant textbooks. And after every lecture, uh, in case we have used a blackboard or actually my whiteboard, I'm gonna put in uh, the handwritten notes. So you will also have access to what was done then. So this is the basic content of the uh, GitHub folder. And if you go back here, you will find a link to the weekly uh, material. And that weekly material looks something like this. So today we are going to uh, look at a brief introduction of what this course is about and a basic setup and outline of what is coming. And then we are going to dive into uh, a description of project number one. And I will tell a little bit, say a little bit more about what comes in the exercise or, or lab session afterwards as well. So the, uh, this is where you find the weekly slides and I've just placed them in different formats, either PDF or some HTML formats or as a Jupyter notebook, if you prefer that. And in the lectures, I'm gonna mainly run things using Jupyter notebooks. 
but I will come back to that setup. And if you go back to the uh, basic GitHub address, there's also a link to the uh, uh, a more extensive lecture notes, which I have developed. And you can take a look into that one. And that will also contain links to uh, videos of the lectures, et cetera, et cetera. I will also send you an email with the link to the uh, lecture video for every session which we have. So the lab sessions will, however, not be recorded, if that's okay. Any questions so far? I mean, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions if things are unclear. The, um, if there are no questions, I actually wanted to uh, dive into the uh, uh, material for this week. So this semester, we're actually starting a week later. Last year, we actually we started in the week before, which is week three. Uh, if you scroll down here, you will find also, down, down towards the end here, you will also find uh, the link to the first project. And this is the one where we have put a tentative deadline of March the 31st. And project number two is not yet ready because that depends on, uh, also on your inputs. And this is, uh, has a deadline of June the 1st. The uh, uh, last session may most likely be May 19 to uh, May 15 to 19, which actually translates into Thursday the 18th, a very popular day for Norwegians, by the way. The um, uh, material which we have for this week, so let's just go quickly through that and give you a brief, brief introduction. So we um, are going to put an emphasis on uh, stochastic methods. And I will try to uh, explain to you why uh, we are using uh, Monte Carlo methods to solve quantum mechanical problems. There are many reasons for that. And I will gradually try to explain why. And there are many, many uh, elements which are included here, which also contain the uh, learning outcomes of this course when it comes to numerical methods. So I want to give you a brief introduction today, and we're also going to get started with variational Monte Carlo methods. And uh, many of you may have heard about the Metropolis algorithm. I'm not sure if everybody has. So there will be some element of repetition. And then when it comes to programming, uh, you can choose, uh, and we will actually, during the lab sessions and also during the lectures, we will switch between C++ and Python. And today, Eivind is going to uh, discuss with you a basic C++ framework for solving project number one, and also for moving on to project number two here. So there will be teaching material, there will be some asynchronous videos, the uh, lecture notes and reading assignments, you will get an email typically before the week begins. And uh, that will also contain some additional uh, background material. After the lectures, I will typically upload the video of the lectures and there will be handwritten notes. Uh, there are also lectures from Physics 3150, 4150, if you're interested in uh, looking in more details on, at the Metropolis algorithm, but we are going to derive the Metropolis algorithm in the lectures here. So this is a little bit about the topic for today. So in the lab session, which begins at the quarter past four, then Eivind uh, will discuss in more detail a possible framework for C++, uh, a C++ program for solving project number one. Whereas I, in the lecture, since I will also make some simple runs, I will then use Python as a programming language because that allows me also to visualize things. But uh, the Python part is also going to be important for those of you who want to use Python because we have the possibility of using automatic differentiation uh, when it comes to calculating the derivatives of trial wave functions. And that's something which is uh, worth looking into uh, as a computational element by itself. That means the algorithm for automatic differentiation. And this is something which we will also discuss. And there is a, a Python a library, which is called JAX, J-A-X, which we are going to look at when we develop our codes. So you can choose actually between Python and C++ programming. I will come back a little bit to uh, uh, 
type of programming languages which we can help you with. Now, we don't have a unique textbook here and uh, because some of the textbook may focus more on uh, statistical methods. Some of the textbooks may uh, focus on uh, spin systems, which have been very popular in physics, especially when you're looking at the phase transitions and or more simple models like the easy model, the POTS model, these kind of simplified Hamiltonians, which just contain spin interactions, uh, where you can actually run the calculations on a simulation lattice. These are very popular methods. And uh, I'm coming back to uh, the possibility for studying these methods as well. But we have decided to have a first project, which is going to be common to everybody, in order to uh, uh, define some basic elements of Monte Carlo methods. So uh, we have some aims here. With the uh, So we want you to be able to apply uh, central money body methods. And uh, variational Monte Carlo methods are actually some of the simpler methods to implement from a mathematical point of view. And this is the main reason why we start with Monte Carlo methods. So it's the, uh, in essence, it's you having to evaluate by stochastic methods a multidimensional integral. That's the essence of uh, a variational Monte Carlo method. We also have a trial wave function which are using. And this trial wave function is meant to obey the variational principle. So when you run the calculation for a set of parameters, you are going to find the optimal minimum. And that optimal minimum defines your, in case you're calculating the energy, that defines your optimal energy. So uh, the method is very simple to implement. Uh, simple, I mean, there's always a quotation mark around simple. So when, when some teachers or some people claim that the calculations are simple, you should always be suspicious. Nothing is simple. But Monte Carlo methods have what we might call from a mathematical point of view, a lower entry level of complexity. So what we want you to then is to understand how to simulate quantum mechanical systems with many interacting particles. The uh, methods are relevant for several uh, subfields in physics, like atomic, condensed matter physics, molecular physics, if you're dealing with quantum chemistry, material science, not the least, uh, systems from nanotechnology, like this is one of the system we are going to look at is in the first case is a system of uh, uh, integer spin systems like bosons. And this system was actually used to uh, simulate uh, parts of the physics of a Bose-Einstein phase transition or weakly interacting gases, which have been trapped in specific ion traps or penning traps and by laser cooling. So this is a, a technology which was developed in the eighties and the nineties and has actually led to a series of Nobel prizes in physics, experimental ones and theoretical ones. So the capability to trap ions in small regions in space by manipulating electric quadrupole fields uh, is a technique which led to the Nobel Prize in Physics in, in 1989. And it was given to the people who developed uh, traps, which are called penning traps and ion traps. Ion traps are, by the way, used as one of the uh, uh, potential technologies for making quantum computers. So from the experimental side, there's been a huge progress. And what we are going to do is to try to simulate these systems, trapped systems, whether they are bosonic systems or fermionic systems by running Monte Carlo calculations. So uh, the other thing is obviously for you to learn to manage and structure larger projects with things like unit tests, object orientations, and also writing clean code. So there is an element in this course which deals with, uh, with uh, writing proper code. The, uh, another thing which is very important is the statistical analysis of large data sets. So when you run many of these Monte Carlo calculations, you often produce uh, huge data sets. And uh, how to analyze this and compute uh, standard deviations, for instance, for uh, the mean values which you calculate to give an error estimate on the variables which you obtain is something which can be done by uh, 
resampling methods like blocking, which many of you may have heard of, but most likely many of you have heard much more about a method which is called bootstrapping. But bootstrapping is normally used to smaller data sets, whereas in this case, you're going to produce billions of data points. And then there is a method which is uh, as a more favorable scaling when it comes to large data sets, and that's called the blocking method. And that's a method which we are going to use to analyze uh, the statistical uh, standard deviations from a calculated mean value. Because when you run a Monte Carlo calculation, you are evaluating integrals in a stochastic way, which in turn means that you are uh, calculating the mean value of an integral. And that means that you also want to evaluate the statistical error which you have, which is given by the standard deviation. Then we are going to look at parallelization and code optimizations. And this would be part of the first project. And then, depending on your scientific interests, uh, we always like to have a, a much more flexibility with project number two. And uh, this depends also on your area of uh, interest, uh, your master thesis topic. So we have uh, we have often had uh, different groups which uh, work on different types of uh, uh, many body methods. So we had people looking at the uh, Hartree-Fock theory, uh, time-dependent Hartree-Fock theory, uh, copper cluster theory, which is very popular in quantum chemistry, but also in fields like nuclear physics and atomic and molecular physics. Uh, we have uh, density functional theory and mean field methods like Hartree-Fock theory, which are extremely popular in material science and condensed matter physics, in addition, obviously, to Monte Carlo methods. So project number two is going to be a project which uh, uh, you can, uh, and we really welcome uh, feedback from you, uh, where you can actually come with suggestions for what could be done. So we're gonna have lectures via Zoom and the uh, lecture time is the one you see here. And the first time is today. And most likely the last one, is May 18, but we can switch that. Uh, as I said, I mean, May 18 is not the most popular day. And uh, we could think of either having the last lecture this, the week before, or maybe even have a week later. And the same with the last computer lab. So we've put uh, the deadlines. So the deadlines are always tentative in the sense that you should view the deadlines as a way for you to plan the semester. And we know that something may always go wrong. I mean, you may have a, a ugly bug, which uh, has uh, taken weeks to find and your delay does. So we always very, comp we try to be uh, accommodating when it comes to deadlines. And as I said, there's also no final exam here. There's only project work. So you get uh, evaluated on the two projects which you hand in. That's what forms the uh, basis for the evaluation. And both projects are weighted 50% each. So we have two ones, electronic projects. We use Canvas for handing in the projects. Uh, the two project counts 50% of the final mark. And then we, uh, uh, as you've probably seen, for those of you being in 397, there are no PCs, so please bring your laptops. So. Uh, if you don't want to use C++ and Python, which we will uh, use in the lecture, so the examples we will give you, they will be examples written in C++ and Python. And as I mentioned, Eivind, after the uh, introduction to the course and the first kind of uh, uh, run through Monte Carlo methods, Eivind is going to present you a C++ framework for solve working with project number one. And I will, uh, in the same way, I will discuss the basic elements of what enters project number one and its solution uh, during the various lectures using Python. And uh, obviously libraries like NumPy, which you all are very familiar with, uh, JAX, automatic differentiation and other ones. However, I mean, if you want to use other languages, feel free to do so. So I have uh, done a lot of programming in Fortran. So if somebody wants to write in Fortran, uh, I can obviously always help you. 
So that's actually my first programming language before I switched to C++ and Python. Uh, Eivind has been writing a lot of code in Rust, which uh, I, ac I actually had a student who wrote uh, uh, the thesis, uh, the PhD thesis in Rust. It was a little bit slower, but it's a language which uh, is very favorable when it comes to memory leakage. So one of the problems with C++ has always been memory leakage. And uh, I know also that uh, many of you may like to use Julia. So what we can help you with are actually these five languages. That's where we feel we have some kind of expertise. If you're using other languages, uh, you may be on your own. But if you feel pretty familiar and confident with that, uh, the, uh, uh, you should feel free to use that. So I should say one thing. When it comes often to scientific computing, one of the things you will see is that, uh, and this is what you are going to encounter at your master level or PhD level, is that C++ and Fortran tend to be the kind of standard languages in scientific computing. And many legacy libraries like LAPAC, which actually uh, NumPy is nothing but a wrapper to LAPAC. Uh, LAPAC is, stands for Linear Algebra Package is written in Fortran. And you will see that there are many old Fortran 77 and even Fortran 66 codes. I think they have changed all the Fortran 66 codes now. But the uh, it, you will often see it written in a kind of more archaic uh, Fortran. Uh, C++ is also a uh, almost kind of standard default language in scientific computings. So C++ and Fortran tend to be the languages which many, many uh, computational physics and computational science codes are written in. But Python is, uh, uh, is, on, the, is on the rise. And, uh, but in many cases, you will see that uh, big libraries like LAPAC, they contain interfaces to Python and Julia and Rust and other languages. Any questions so far about languages? So th this is gonna be the, uh, the basic framework which we will follow in this, in this course. So feel free to uh, come questions. Any questions so far? Okay. So what I wanted to say a little bit about is the topics which are covered. So we are going to look at parallelization and many of you may be taking IN4200. So you will encounter many of these elements from IN4200. Uh, we are going to look at the algorithms for Monte Carlo simulations. So these are algorithms like Metropolis Hastings, important sampling. Uh, there are improved Monte Carlo methods. There's something which is called uh, backpropagation, which is not the same as what you have in, uh, in, uh, in uh, machine learning, but is a way to uh, actually start the uh, Monte Carlo simulation with a smart, in a smarter way. The, uh, the statistical analysis of data from Monte Carlo calculations is something which we're also going to study. There will be eigenvalue solvers as well, which we will need to look at, and also optimization methods. And for project two, there are several possibilities which we normally have presented, and you will find variants of project number two, which should follow these different paths. So you can change project one and replace bosons with fermions. The complication here resides in you having to set up a wave function ansatz, which is anti-symmetric. So many people tend to use that one. We have been looking at Hartree-Fock theory, which is a very popular kitchen item in uh, quantum chemistry, nuclear physics, etc. simulations. And we have also had projects on time-dependent Hartree-Fock theory, which is also very interesting when you're looking at the time evolution and the dynamics of a physical system, especially if you're looking at reactions. Then we have copper cluster theory, which is a kind of standard method in quantum chemistry for solving many body problems. All these are approximative methods. Another thing which many people have liked to do is actually to take the physics problems in project one and apply uh, machine learning, which essentially means that instead of having a trial wave function, you're replacing that with a neural network. And the neural network is the one which is going to uh, find the optimal representation of the solution of Schrodinger's equation for many particles. This number four is a pretty hot field. I mean, 
I am a little bit biased here because that's a central element of my, my own research nowadays. And if you're interested in that, uh, that's uh, a one possible path for the second project. We also have uh, other possibilities. Uh, we have now a known course where we deal with quantum computing. And uh, this is, has been a little bit less likely, but the, the first four are actually projects which uh, many people have liked to study. Then, if we look at the topics which we are going to deal with, those of you familiar with the uh, uh, physics SDK, uh, the machine learning course, or the other types of machine learning course, you have probably gone through the search for minima in multidimensional spaces. Now, when we run a variational Monte Carlo calculation, which is a kind of default methods in, or in the starting point for Monte Carlo methods, what you end up with is a trial wave function, which will depend on many parameters. So what you're doing then, you're going to search for a minima in a multidimensional space. And then methods like conjugate gradient, steepest descent, some quasi-Newton methods, uh, Broyden, Jacobian, and other ones, uh, or even just the stochastic gradient descent, uh, which are methods which many of you have met, uh, are methods which we will also implement. So that means convex optimization and gradient methods. Uh, for those of you familiar with machine learning, these are methods which you have seen before. And they uh, are used in this field as well. We are going to look at iterative methods for solutions of nonlinear equations. Uh, there will be obviously object orientation, data analysis and resampling techniques. We have the variational Monte Carlo for, and Abinitio stands from first principle. Uh, which means that we're actually starting with what we think is the uh, full Hamiltonian of the system, and we just let that lose on the on the system. So ab initio means that you uh, start normally with what you think are the uh, basic constituents, but in principle, ab initio is a kind of misnomer for physics calculations because physics deals always with finding effective degrees of freedom. So like I work a lot in nuclear physics, but also condensed matter physics. And in nuclear physics, we normally don't deal with quarks and gluons, but we deal with protons and neutrons and some other effective degrees of freedom represented by mesons like the pion. We are going to look at the simulation of two and three dimensional systems. This is one possibility. So this could be bosonic systems, or we could look at quantum dot systems, which are hot systems when it comes to uh, nanotechnologies and quantum computing. These are some of the candidate systems for making quantum computers. The simulation of trapped bosons, which uh, is a kind of field which uh, paved the way for what I would call the second quantum revolution because you're able to confine few particles in small regions. And uh, within the uncertainty principle, you can actually claim that this boson or this fermion is localized in a small region in space. And uh, in this case, this is project number one, which is a starting point. And then you could think of machine learning and neural networks. That's another uh, project. You can extend project one to fermionic systems. If somebody wants to do something totally different, like copper cluster theory, if that's of interest, we can define that as well. So there are several options here which you can uh, follow uh, for the uh, for the final project. So what I wanted to say a little bit briefly about now is the basics of uh, Monte Carlo and give you a kind of motivation for why we uh, are going to deal with Monte Carlo methods. So uh, I mentioned to you that uh, the uh, basic mathematical quantity which we are going to evaluate in a variational Monte Carlo calculation is the expectation value of a given Hamiltonian, which is now given, and this is a multi-dimensional integral. And if we are dealing with, uh, as we have as an example here, if we think of uh, atomic neon, which has 10 electrons in three dimensions. So that means that we would have for each electron here, we have uh, three spatial directions and we have uh, 10 electrons. So that means that we would have a 30 degrees of freedom for that specific integral. 
So that would, this integral turns into a 30 dimensional integral. So we have three spatial directions and 10 particles. Now, what happens is that normally we would discretize these integrals. And when we discretize this R1 in the X and the Y in the C direction, would then be described by a certain amount of integration points. So suppose you have 10 of these integration points and you have, uh, so you have 10 so-called integration points or mesh points as they're being called, as you can see here. And if you have 10 particles like this in three dimensions, this becomes with 10 integration points in each direction, this becomes a 10 to the 30th dimensional integral. And if you now have a one teraflop machine, it means that you can do 10 to the 12 floating point iterations, no e calculation per second. And if you assume that every operation takes the same amount of time, you can easily calculate and uh, the number of floating point operations you can do and how much time it will take. So you need to do 10 to the 30th floating point operations. If you think that all multiplications, calls to functions, et cetera, et cetera, take this same number of time, which is normally not true because multiplication uh, is more time consuming than addition and subtraction. But let's just assume that. So you have 10 particles, uh, 10 integration points and three dimensions. So that's a 10 to the 30th dimensional integral. And you can do 10 to the 12th floating point operations per second. And then you can easily do the mathematics and compare that with the estimated lifetime of the universe, which is 10 to the 17 seconds. So even with 10 integration points, which is something which for an atom, like the neon atom, is going to be a pretty, uh, let's say, approximative calculation you will not be able to evaluate this integral within the lifetime of the universe. So that clearly tells you that the, uh, the, uh, we have to think of other methods. Uh, you can take another example, which is from nuclear many body physics. So this A is the number of protons and neutrons. Uh, you would have a Hamiltonian problem, which you can trans translate into couple differential equations. So you can rewrite the Schrodinger equation here and if you're looking at the time independent part of the Schrodinger equation, you can then translate that one into couple differential equations for A, which is N plus C, N being the number of neutrons and Z the number of protons. And these are just the R's are the coordinates and the alphas are just additional quantum numbers. What you would end up with then is this as a number of coupled second order differential equations. And if you're looking at the neon, no beryllium, then it gives you more than 200,000 couple differential equations. And that's something which from a basic linear algebra point of view, if you're solving these kind of equations, that is not going to be very practical. And if you're dealing with partial differential equations, if you're doing quantum mechanics, then you will typically uh, be able to tackle with the standard methods for partial differential equations like finite element methods or finite different ones, you can deal with two to three particles typically. And in our case, we will have uh, millions of trapped bosons in one of these ion traps, because that's what was of interest to study the phase transition from a standard fluid to a Bose-Einstein condensate. So basically the technique for producing this Bose-Einstein condensates is that you have a gas of uh, uh, bosons, Actually, these are uh, ions with a charge, which leads to a system which has integer spin. They are weakly interacting. And if you think of the velocity distribution of these uh, atoms or ions actually trapped in a, by an electric quadrupole field, you can uh, use laser cooling, which is a technique where you slow down the, uh, you take the, the, uh, distribution of velocities of this gas, and you can target the highest velocities. If you think of a Gaussian distribution of velocity, that's just simply the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocity for a given temperature. And then you can cool down by laser cooling, by sending photons in, colliding with the uh, ions. And then you can simply slow down 
those ions which have a larger velocity. And then at the end, you can, uh, by laser cooling, you can cool down or reduce the velocity of all the ions so that the, the velocity or the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution just peaks around one velocity. So you have a system, a money body system, which acts collectively with just one velocity or something which is very close to one velocity. And people have designed lasers on that. That's a very, that actually this uh, technique of Bose-Einstein condensation, ex the experimental techniques which have been developed, they have paved the way for a lot of the new developments in, for instance, quantum computing technologies. So Monte Carlo methods are and one of many types of many body methods, but as you will see, they have perhaps the lowest level of mathematical complexity compared to, for instance, copper cluster theory or Green's function theories and, and large scale diagonalization methods, also very interesting. They are not that difficult. We have renormalization group methods, and there's a whole plethora of many body methods. Uh, with Monte Carlo methods, if we deal with diffusion Monte Carlo methods, we actually have the possibility to solve uh, almost exactly a complicated interacting money body system. So diffusion Monte Carlo, which bases itself on a variational Monte Carlo calculation in order to provide a good answer for the energy. This is uh, a method which is a kind of gold standard in money body physics and provides a true benchmark for what other money body methods should actually reproduce. So uh, I will try to convince you about many of the things which you see here. Uh, Monte Carlo methods are what I would say physical intuitive. I will try to motivate you and motivate why. Uh, you can study systems with many degrees of freedom without uh, too much mathematical pain. So copper cluster theory can, for instance, which I've been working on for many years, can be uh, painful. Uh, diffusion Monte Carlo and Green's function Monte Carlo is yielded principle if you can simulate long enough uh, a solution which approach, approaches the exact solution. We will come back to the theory of diffusion Monte Carlo calculations. And that is also a possibility for a second project if somebody wants to deal with diffusion Monte Carlo methods. It's easy to implement, but it needs a reliable trial wave function. Now, with the advent of machine learning, this trial wave function has been replaced by a neural network. And variational Monte Carlo methods, together with uh, machine learning, deep learning methods, give actually results which are at the same level or even better than the diffusion Monte Carlo methods, which are seen as a kind of gold standard in many body physics. Now, diffusion Monte Carlo has, however, a problem when you deal with um, fermions, because it assumes that you have a probability distribution uh, of random walkers. And this probability distribution cannot change sign. And your probability distribution is going to be the wave function. And uh, in uh, for fermionic systems, the wave function is anti-symmetric and it changes sign. And that means that uh, uh, there's something which is called a Monte Carlo sign problem. And that's a big challenge in many body physics. It's such a big challenge that if you're able to solve that one, I can guarantee you, I mean, I will at least vote for that, that you should attend a party where you meet the Swedish king in December. Uh, the solutions have statistical errors, which can be large. The party, which I mentioned, if you didn't get it, and it's actually the Nobel Prize party. There is a limit for how large systems you can study in diffusion Monte Carlo. So even if the method promise that they can solve uh, things so are given accuracy, the diffusion Monte Carlo needs a huge number of random walkers. So the run, the distribution of random walkers represent the wave function. And then you need a huge number of these in case you have a system, uh, a complicated money particle system. You normally obtain only the lowest uh, states with a given symmetry, and you can get excited states with some extra labor. So where and why do we use Monte Carlo methods? So quantum systems with many particles at finer temperature is the method of choice there. Path integral Monte Carlo uh, has been a, a standard method. We have strong correlations. All kinds of mean field theories like Hartree-Fock and density functional theory break down. When we have strongly interacting systems, 
normally people revert to quantum uh, Monte Carlo methods. This Bose-Einstein condensation of dilute gases can be simulated with uh, standard uh, nonlinear partial differential equations, but normally one would use diffusion Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo methods to benchmark the uh, partial differential equation solutions. Light atoms, molecules, solids, and nuclei, standard field of approach. Uh, lattice quantum chromodynamics, which is actually the way to simulate the strong interaction between quarks and gluons on a lattice. That is the standard way to model the strong interaction. Uh, and this is basically impossible to solve without Monte Carlo calculations. And then tons of physics systems from semiconductor physics to nanotechnologies, uh, material science, you name it and you have it. So uh, I see we are uh, at the hour. Uh, this was the kind of introduction. And after the break, what I wanted to do now is actually to uh, slow down the pace a little bit. And we're going to jump a little bit between the whiteboard and the, uh, and the slides here. But let's take a small pause and put the recording on pause. So after the, uh, uh, the, this first uh, lecture, we are going to have a, in the uh, lab session, which will be in person, but also via Zoom, we are going to have a, uh, a discussion of uh, how you can structure a C++ code uh, for solving project number one. Now for solving project number one, as we mentioned before the break, you are free to use a programming language which you want. Uh, we will, however, in the lab sessions and during the lectures, we will mainly focus on Python and C++ because these seem now to be, together with Fortran, uh, the kind of standard languages in scientific programming. C++ and Fortran are still the uh, most used programming languages in computational physics, but Python is really catching up now. So what I wanted to say something uh, about now is a little bit about the mathematics of the variational Monte Carlo approach, which is actually the basic approach itself is not very difficult to get started with. And we're going to end this session with a very simple demonstration using, for instance, the harmonic oscillator. So uh, the, basically what we are doing is that we are calculating an expectation value of a given Hamiltonian, but where we don't have the exact wave function. And this wave function which we have is given by this psi of t, where t stands for trial. So we are making some kind of guess, whether this is an intelligent guess or not. In some cases, we can actually find uh, specific mathematical properties which the wave function has to have. And we will see that, like when we are looking at systems where we have a Coulomb type of interaction, there's going to be a divergence in the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy in three dimension will contain a term which goes like one over the relative distance multiplied with the first derivative of the wave function. And then the Coulomb interaction is going to have a term which goes like one over the relative distance between two particles. And in case this relative distance goes to zero, then we can have problems with divergences. But these two divergences, one from the kinetic energy and one from the potential energies, in order for them to cancel, that leads to a specific mathematical form of the solution, which we could include when we design this guess for the wave function psi of t. So this psi of t is going to be a function which contains what we normally call variational parameters. Uh, we are coming back to that. Now, one thing which I just quickly wanted to remind you of is that uh, there is something which is called the variational uh, principle and or the variational theorem. And that simply states that if you do not have the exact wave function, the energy you will calculate, this quantity here, is going to be larger or equal, in case you have the exact one, to the exact energy E0. So this would be the ground state energy which you're looking after. And your expectation value in case you don't have the exact wave function will always in accordance with the variational principle be larger or at best equal to the energy you're looking after. And let me just quickly remind you of that before we switch over to the slides. 
So if you have uh, and the exact solutions of this psi of i, or the exact solutions of the Hamiltonian problem, we could then think of expanding the trial wave function in these exact solutions, which we, by the way, we don't have, but we assume that the solution to H spans a uh, Hilbert space of uh, orthogonal wave functions. And if we apply the, uh, this ansatz here, where we now rewrite the trial wave function in terms of uh, the exact solutions, then we can uh, plug that one in, in the, into the integral and also include the uh, uh, denominator, which is this one. This is in case we uh, don't have a normalized wave function. And then when we uh, calculate these values, we know that this psi of n's, they are the uh, solutions to h. So that means that h acting on psi of n gives us now the uh, uh, exact uh, energy multiplied with the wave function. And since these wave functions are normalized, what we end up with is simply a sum over these expansion coefficients multiplied with the energies and divided by the sum over these expansion coefficients. And this quantity is here. It's a quantity which you can easily prove is always larger or equal to the exact solution. So if uh, A0 is the only one which uh, is valid here, then you have A0 divided by A0 squared and multiply with E0, and that's obviously equal to E0 if there is only one coefficient. So the variational principle yields always the lowest state of a given symmetry. Now, how can we use this when we are going to set up the basics of uh, the variational Monte Carlo method? So what we are going to look at now is just some of the basic ingredients which we are going to need now. And let's switch to the, to, the, uh, to the whiteboard so we can just slow down the pace a little bit. And also let me take a quick look at the chat here because I see that there are some questions in the chat here. Okay, so let me just stop that one. Uh, no problem here. So you should be able to see my whiteboard now. And uh, what, what we are going to do now is simply to set up the basic mathematical ingredients of a variational Monte Carlo calculation. So the VMC, which is going to be my acronym for variational Monte Carlo methods. So let's just call this variational Monte Carlo basics. So what we are going to define is that so-called trial wave function. And we are coming back to the way this can look like. Define trial wave function or trial state function, which is better because often when we uh, think of the wave function, we are thinking of the solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So I will sloppily switch between state function and wave function. And we are going to call this, we are not going to look at time, but we are going to call this a psi of t. And this will depend on the positions of the different particles, r1, r2, up to some rn. So these are the number of particles which we have. And then we may have additional quantum numbers. And these quantum numbers could be given by a set of uh, uh, quantum numbers like uh, gamma one, gamma two, etc., up to some gamma of n. These are quantum numbers which could define uh, the spin degrees of freedom, just to give you an example. And at the end, we I'm going to rewrite this as a vector alpha. And this alpha is a vector which now is going to contain a set of variational parameters, alpha one, alpha two, up to some alpha of n. And these are called variational parameters. So these are going to be parameters in our theory. And we can vary these parameters so that what we get is the optimal energy. So the um, quantity which we have here, this trial wave function, it's something which we can be guided by using our physics insights about the specific problem. Alternatively, if you're interested in dealing with this project where you apply neural networks to the solution of Schrodinger's equation, you would replace this trial wave function 
with a neural network and let the neural network find the optimal representation of the trial wave function. So this is the uh, one possible path, which actually leads to a very exciting field nowadays, where you use the variational technology, variational Monte Carlo methods, together with the machine learning methods to solve Schrodinger's equation. That's an alternative for project number two. Now, these variational parameters, what we would do then is actually to optimize them. So we are going to then have an optimization problem where we will find an energy, which is going to be a solution in terms of these parameters. And now we are going to put a hat on top of this just to indicate that this is the optimized problem. So this is going to be an argmin of the integral, the following integral, where we now are looking at a, an integral over dr1, dr2, etc. And then we have this trial wave function multiplied with this trial wave function complex conjugate. And this is a function of all these variables. I'm just putting dots in here. There is a Hamiltonian acting on this trial wave function. So this is H stands for an operator. H hat is an operator. And this contains these R1s up here. And then we divide this by the normalization constant. And then we have a dr1, et cetera, up to drn, the number of particles we have. And then we have simply the wave function squared here. And I'm writing this a little bit sloppily without putting in all the uh, dependencies on, on the Rs and the gammas and the alphas. And this is going to be an optimization problem with respect to these alphas, where alpha is a real vector of length n. Then, so when we are solving this problem, then we would vary alphas in order to find the optimal or the minimal energy in order to find the minimal energy as a function of these parameters alpha, minimal energy. So to give you an example, suppose we only have one parameter. This means that we would have a plot of this type. So one parameter alpha, and then we plot or we calculate the energy as a function of these parameters alpha. And here there's gonna be an optimal alpha. So alpha is a scalar now, that's why we put a vector sign. And then we would have something like this. This is a typical uh, curve, which we would get. And this will be the E optimal. And that's the point which we are going to look after. So in, in essence, uh, what this course deals about, I mean, the first, the, the first project is to calculate the energy as a function of given variational parameters and try to find the optimal energy. So this at the end, this is going to be essentially a convex optimization problem. And for those of you who have taken a course like physics SDK 4155 or 3155, you've already encountered uh, convex optimization problems. So this is a in principle, just a convex optimization problem. Now, if you look at the quantum mechanical uh, calculation, which we have put up here, this is something when we are now calculating an expectation value, this is something which is not so trivial to uh, apply the standard rules of statistics. So if you think of standard statistics, and when you calculate an expectation value, definition of an expectation value the way you would do that and now I'm just writing this e in this specific way this is the expectation value of a quantity x and if we have a continuous uh, probability distribution and we integrate over x over a specific domain. So we would have an integral dx multiplied with x multiplied with a probability distribution. And we know that normally this probability distribution is normalized. When we integrate over the domain of possible events, 
and this is normalized to one. And we can calculate many, many other types of, uh, of expectation values. Now, if you look at the, the integral which we have, the one which we have up here, this doesn't look like a probability times something. However, we can actually rewrite the problem which we have in terms of uh, a probability times uh, a quantity which we're going to label as the local energy. So let's see how we can look at the uh, way to rewrite the expectation value. This E, which we wrote in this way, E of alpha, in terms of uh, a probability times something. So what we would define first, define the probability. And now we are going to use the standard quantum mechanical definition of a probability using the Born uh, approach. So we are going to have a P, which is going to be a function of R1, R2, up to Rn, all the particles which we have. It may depend on additional quantum numbers. So this could be spin degrees of freedom, but we leave them unspecified. And then we have these variational parameters, which I now just write in terms of this vector alpha. So we can have more than one variational parameter. You will typically see in many variational Monte Carlo calculations that people can have some 20, 30 variational parameters. In project number one, we are gonna make life simpler for ourselves. And there's gonna be at most one or two parameters. So life is gonna be much simpler. The um, uh, machine learning approach on the other hand, since you then are going to introduce weights and biases in the neural networks, you can have uh, tons of parameters to optimize. And then your function to integrate is going to contain, what's going to lead an optimization problems in a multidimensional space. Now, let me now redefine this in terms of just a P, of uh, a quantity which I'm just gonna call R. And then I have this parameter alpha. And this R is now going to be a new collective container for R1, R2, etc., up to Rn. And then it's also gonna contain these additional quantum numbers. So you can think of this uh, quantity R as a kind of new collective container, which now contains all the single particle degrees of freedom. So that means it could be the positions of the given single particles, it could be the spins or other additional quantum numbers which are needed to classify, let's say, a specific orbit or state which a single particle can be in. And we are going to make the wave function as a product of different single particle states. We're coming back to that later. So this quantity P of R of alpha is something which we will define now as the quantum mechanical probability of this trial wave function squared, obviously. And then we are going to have an integral here. And this integral can entail a sum as well if we have discrete spin values, but we are gonna just write it in terms of this collective container, this uh, R. And this contains now the normalization of the wave function. Now, the normalization factor itself is something which we luckily, when we're going to uh, apply or implement the Metropolis algorithm, we are going to look at the ratios of probabilities. And we will never need to calculate the uh, normalization factor. This is like uh, if some of you, if, if you have studied uh, statistical mechanics and you've encountered a quantity which is called the partition function. The partition function is nothing but an optimization uh, and normalization parameter. So what we can do next now is also to define something which we will call or label as the local energy. And that's going to be given by this quantity E of L, and it's gonna be a function of R and the, the uh, variational parameters. And it's going to be given by one divided by psi of t of r of alpha 
and then I have the Hamiltonian, which uh, can depend on spin as well. And this acts on the wave function psi of t of r of alpha. So H does not contain any alpha dependence. So H contains typically kinetic energy plus uh, various interaction energies. And in case the particle is moving in an external potential, it could be something like the attraction from an atomic nucleus, which an electron sees. It could be a harmonic oscillator trap or other types of external potentials, which can be applied to a system which confine the motion of an object. Now then, if you look at the um, uh, expression which we have for the energy, so we define the energy in terms of this parameter alpha. This is a quantity we want to optimize. This is now given by this integral where we have a psi of t multiplied with h. And I'm going to be a little bit sloppy now. And I'm not going to write out all the dependencies on the different parameters. So this is going to contain psi of t squared. Now, if you look at the expression which we have now for the probability and for this local energy, we can actually rewrite the equation now. And we have to be a little bit careful because we have to make sure that when we take h multiplied with psi of t and then divide by psi of t that this doesn't lead to uh, divergences. So uh, we can rewrite this now in terms of an integral over this um, probability, which we have P of R of alpha multiplied with the local energy of R of alpha, and then integrated over D of R. Now, when we are going to run this in terms of a Monte Carlo calculation, this is now going to be replaced by, and we will derive this uh, next week when we look at the metropolis algorithm. Uh, this is, but now we're just gonna, we are just gonna state it. So this will now contain a loop over the number of Monte Carlo cycles or just simply samples, MCS. So Monte Carlo samples. So this stands for the number of Monte Carlo samples or simply samples. So it's just a shorthand which I'm using. And then, so that means that the probability distribution which we uh, are inserting here is just one over the number of cycles. And then we can use the law of large numbers because then we know that when the number of Monte Carlo samples goes to infinity, then we should approach the true expectation value. And this is going to be given by the sum from i equal one up to the number of Monte Carlo cycles. And it will contain the uh, specific uh, sample, which we have picked out, which now is represented by specific positions of the particles. And as a function of these parameters alpha. So this is the quantity which we are going to implement. And uh, next week, we are going to derive in more detail the Monte Carlo uh, algorithm. But what happens now is that you can think of this when you want to set up the algorithm, the basics of the algorithm, before we have derived the Monte Carlo or the Metropolis algorithms, basics of algo. So you would typically initialize the system. And you would fix, so you need to define the number of Monte Carlo cycles. This is a quantity you have to fix. You would need to define an initial position. Which we now define as an R. And then you need also to set up the variational parameters. So define the array of parameters. And you can start these with random variables or you can start them with uh, some specific values in case you're able to constrain the optimal region. Then you would typically uh, define the energy 
the expectation value. This will be an array of uh, all the parameters you have. You would define that as zero. You would also need to calculate the variance of V of alpha. And you would typically initialize these quantities to be zero. So you would initialize the uh, energy and you would initialize the uh, quantities which you need to calculate the variance. Then what you would do then is then for, you would have a loop here for I equal one to the number of Monte Carlo cycles. The next thing you would calculate a trial position, a new trial position, which you could rewrite as the old position. And we're gonna label this with the or in it here. So in it plus some uh, random number, which I'm gonna label as a little r times a parameter delta. So the little r is a random number, which now could typically be a random number between zero and one, for instance. And this delta is a step size. This type of approach, which I'm setting up here, so we would actually define this step size as well here. I forgot to put that one up here, define delta. This is how far you jump with a given probability distribution. So just to give you an example, you can put that one in here. Suppose you have a one dimensional Gaussian and you have X here and minus X. So this would be zero here. This is your probability distribution. And then when you're jumping here, if you have a position R in it, here, this position here, and that gives you a probability distribution here. Then you can jump with a step size, which brings you out here. So then you would jump into a region where the probability is zero. So this means that you have Delta is large. If you do that, you would be then be jumping. You could now jump in a new position where you could jump back again. But you see now if Delta is a very large parameter, you will be jumping in and out of regions where the probability distribution could be non-zero. That will lead to something which is called an inefficient uh, algorithm because you would, uh, uh, when your probability distribution is zero, if you go back to the integral you want to calculate and you look at the integral here, Clearly, if the probability distribution is zero and you jumped into those regions, then you're just going to have zero multiplied with an energy. And you would like to avoid these kind of jumps. So later, we are going to see how we can bake in more physics into this parameter delta. And that's going to lead to something which is called important sampling so that we will never need to tune a parameter delta where we have places or uh, occasions where we jump out into regions where the probability is zero. If you, on the other hand, you jump in very small positions, then you will basically sample a very small part of the integral. So tuning this delta here, you should tune it so you can sample uh, all the positions where the probability distribution is non-zero. So we're coming back to that. So delta becomes a parameter here. And when you choose, normally what you would do is to choose this parameter and so that you accept roughly 50% of the samples. This is a kind of ad hoc rule. So it's you accepting with a kind of a coin flip probability, the, uh, the next step or just rejecting it. So there's nothing deeper than that. Then in order to accept the move, what you would do then is to use the Metropolis algorithm and we are going to derive that in detail next week. So the Metropolis algorithm uh, accept or reject the move with a given probability, accept if the ratio between probability, if this W, which is equal to the ratio between the probabilities in the new position divided with the probability in the previous position is smaller 
than a given random number, smaller or equal than an R random number, where R is now prime, is again a number between zero and one. So we're going to derive the metropolis algorithm. That's the way we typically accept or reject the suggested move. So if the step is accepted, what happens then is that we set the new position on new equal to this suggested position which we had, which was our init, the initial one which we had, plus this random number times this parameter delta, the step size. And when we have done that, we would update averages for the energy and for the variance, another quantity which we are going to uh, need in the calculations. This is the basics of the Monte Carlo machinery. So this would then be end for loop. And we're going to see a, an example now where we actually implement this. And the simplest possible example we can look at is an example where we now look at the uh, harmonic oscillator in just one dimension. So let's uh, take that example, and this is included in the slide. So we are going to look at a harmonic oscillator in one dimension. And then we're going to look at how we can code it with using the Metropolis algorithm. So we are going to put H bar equals C and equal to the mass of the particle. And since this is a harmonic oscillator, we're going to put all these parameters equal to one just to simplify things. The trial wave function is just in one dimension. So that means that we have just X and then we have a one parameter alpha. So we don't need to put vector signs. And we know that the exact solution actually, if we take the exponential, we, if we're looking after the ground state for harmonic oscillator in one dimension, we have a parameter alpha, the variational parameter alpha. And we know that when alpha is equal to one, we have the exact solution. Now we can now calculate the local energy for this specific function. And that's pretty straightforward to calculate. So this X of alpha is now simply equal to one over psi of T. And then we have the harmonic oscillator, which is gonna be given by minus. And now we are, since we have put energies, you now the masses H bar and C equal to one, we're just going to have a half of D dx and then we have plus the harmonic oscillator and since the parameters are just put all the parameters are put to one uh, we have a frequency also the harmonic oscillator frequency equal to one so we just have one half x squared and this is multiplied with psi of t and if i do the calculations this is just simply going to give me one half and then i have alpha squared plus x squared of one minus alpha to the power of four. So that is gonna be my local energy. And then I can calculate, I'm just gonna give you the final result here. I'm going to calculate the expectation value of the energy, which then is simply the probability distribution, P of X of alpha, and X goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, multiplied with E of L of X, of alpha, and then I have D of X. So this is just an integral which involves uh, uh, exponentials with X squared as argument. And I can actually calculate this expectation value. So the expectation value of the energy as a function of uh, this parameter alpha is going to be given of alpha plus one over alpha squared. Now, there is more to the picture. I can calculate the variance now. So this is the expectation value of the energy. And clearly, if I now take the derivative of uh, the energy with respect to alpha and require that one to be zero, I can find the point where I have the minimum energy. And you can see that since alpha is a 
comes as alpha squared, this is going to be a convex optimization problem. So find optimal alpha, alpha optimal. You see now that the only thing which we need to do is actually to take D of E of alpha and take the derivative of D alpha here. And this is uh, pretty simple. And that's, we want that to be zero. And that's gonna simply say us that alpha, the optimal alpha is given when alpha is equal to one. We can also calculate the uh, variance of the energy. So I'm gonna write it like this, so E alpha. And this has an analytical solution as well. So the variance of the energy is actually given by the expectation value. So I'm writing it like this, of the energy squ squared. So this is just energy squared minus this expectation value of, so I'm gonna write it like this. So this is the expectation. No, let me just rewrite it. This was a wrong symbol. So this will be the, the expectation value of EL squared times the probability times dx minus the expectation value of the energy or the mean value as we will call it squared. And we can calculate that one also analytically for this specific case. And that's extremely useful when we are setting up our first code. And this is actually the first code you're gonna see here is one of the first ingredients in setting up the, uh, the variational Monte Carlo code for project number one. So this is squared, and then this is multiplied with three. It takes some time to run through all these calculations. And this contains minus uh, this energy of alpha, the optimal energy, which we had up here, this quantity, but this quantity squared. So I'm just giving you the final answer. The calculations are not the most exciting things which we do. So what I wanted to show you now is the uh, Jupyter notebook, which follows the lecture notes for this week, where we actually compute these quantities. And you can see the first skeleton of a variational Monte Carlo code. Now, and then this will also allow me to discuss a little bit more uh, what is going to enter project number one. So let me switch to the Jupyter notebook. And this is uh, roughly one of the last things which I'm going to do today. So let's now, uh, what you will see here in the notes is the same thing which I put up in the, uh, on, in the, uh, on the whiteboard. So I'm simply taking the harmonic oscillator. Before that, there is a similar simple example, which is given by the hydrogen atom, which many of you have probably encountered as the first real physics case when you took quantum physics or quantum mechanics. So this is a similar case, but let's look at the harmonic oscillator. So in the code, which you will find here, uh, there's a pretty straightforward code. There's nothing fancy in it. And the, uh, the first thing I do, I, I like to define uh, places where I uh, place all the files which I produce. Uh, I would typically save my data uh, in this file here. I can save the figures as a uh, PNG file, etc., etc. But here comes the program. So now what you will see now, you have a trial wave function, which in this case receives X, which I label as R. So I can make it more general. It contains the variational parameter alpha. And this is my trial wave function. The local energy is the quantity which I, which we had in the, on the whiteboard, but which is also given by what you have here. So this quantity, which you see here is the local energy. And this defines the wave function and the local energy. And then I perform my Monte Carlo sampling. So in this specific case, I do 100,000 Monte Carlo cycles. So I'm computing stochastically the integral. I have a step size of one. I put my old position and a new position to zero. I see my random number generator. So all these things are things which we're going to discuss in more detail next week. 
Then uh, I have a loop. I know that my minimum is actually around one. I know that from theory calculations. So I'm just starting my alpha from 0.4 and I'm stepping in steps of 0.05. I initialize the energy expectation value and the energy squared, which I will need to calculate the variance. I define my old position here. And you see now that what I'm doing, since the random number goes from zero to one, by subtracting a half, I get numbers between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5. So I will have negative and positive X values. Remember now that I'm just in one dimension, so I need X values, which go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And the way I step through minus, in, minus X values and plus X values is by taking the random number generate, which is a random number between zero and one and subtract a half. And then I have the step size, which I now put to one. Uh, and you will see why later, why one is a reasonable choice here. And then I, construct a new position, as you see here. I have the step size times the random number, and I add to this the old position. I calculate the new wave function, as you can see here, with a new position, alpha parameter, and then I perform the metropolis test, and we will derive the metropolis algorithm next week. So some of you have already seen the derivation. For those of you who have not seen it, or if you've forgotten it, uh, this is something which we will go through and link with the Monte Carlo evaluation of integrals. This means that uh, what we end up with then is a, uh, a new position. If we accept it, so I just put the position old is equal to this uh, trial position. And that means also that the wave function old is equal to the new one. Now here, what I'm doing is that if I don't accept the move, I will still calculate the energy with the old position. That means that I consider not moving as an observation. So you see now that if I don't move, my old position stays with the old, but I update the energy. So this is my local energy update. I calculate the local energy. And this is actually one of the places where we're gonna swallow a lot of CPU cycles. And then I calculate the energy by adding this delta E and I calculate the energy squared. Then when I've done that, I've accumulated all these values. I divide by the number of Monte Carlo cycles. I do the same with the energy squared. And then the variance is the energy squared minus the mean value squared. So my error then is the standard deviation, which is the variance divided, the square root of the variance divided by the number of cycles. In principle, it should be the number of cycles minus one because I don't have the true mean value. So there is a bias here but I'm just leaving that out. And then I make my plot here. So I do max variations, variables 20. Uh, I'm initializing things. I have the exact energies and the exact variance, as you can see here, these values, which we looked at before. And if I run it now, oops, I have to rerun everything up here, which I didn't do. So let's rerun that one. Now that should be, uh, just a moment. What did I do wrong here? Oh, I forgot to take this one, sorry. That's one of the things which is always irritating with Python. You, when you're rerunning it, you have to rerun all the uh, program snippets which you have. So the um, results which you see here in red, that is the exact result, the paper and pencil calculation. And you see now that the uh, optimal value is down at one, as I said, when you take the derivative, you find the exact value there. And that means that the, at the, we have in the calculation here by evaluating the integral with 100,000 samples, we're actually getting pretty spot on the exact value, which is 0.5. Another thing which we observe is that when we have the exact result, the variance is equal to zero. And that's a very important observation. And you can see that here, when alpha is equal to one, the exact value is 0.5. This is the exact energy. 
the variance is exactly equal to zero. So one of the problems we have is sometimes we don't know the exact energy, but if we have the correct wave function, then the variance is exactly equal to zero. And that has simply to do with the fact that when I'm calculating the energy squared, for instance, if I have the exact wave function, then the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function n times gives me just the energy to the power of n. So if I have the energy squared, that simply gives me the energy squared. And then I have the normalization factor divided by the normalization factor. So I get the energy squared. And then I know that the uh, mean value, when I square that, that should be equal to the energy expectation value of the energy squared. So I'm taking energy squared minus energy squared. And that should give me zero if I have the exact wave function. So that's a kind of test of the quality of your answers for the wave function. Now, one thing you will also notice is that with 100,000 samples, the, I'm not getting exactly the same result as the exact one. And that's simply due to the fact that I am just performing 100,000 samples. So I could change this now to, let's say, 1 million, and then it's just gonna take a little bit more time. So let's do that before we uh, stop today. And then I'm just gonna rerun this with 1 million. Oh, I have to rerun everything, sorry. Okay, let's now rerun it. So I, I forgot that, I do 1 million samples. And then we then it's going to take a little bit more time, but not too much. And what you're going to see then, when you run a million Monte Carlo samples, you see now that the results are more spot on. And you see here as well for the variance. In the previous case, you had some differences. And you see now that when you look at the numbers here, you actually have numbers which are closer to the exact ones. And you see that with the variance as well. You had larger deviations. In the previous case, this number here was 2.7. So what you're getting now are numbers which are approaching the exact ones because you have more samples. So there's a trade-off when you run a Monte Carlo calculation between the number of samples you're willing to spend and the quality of the result. So let me just see, we have a question in the chat here. Uh, okay, so let me put in the... Uh, in the uh, in the chat here where you can find all the teaching material so if you go to uh, uh, the lecture slides here if you go to this link so let me put that link in the chat that's a good question uh, so let me just do that so if you click on that link and you scroll down you will find the jupyter notebook but you can also find everything in the basic GitHub address of the course. So if you go to the doc folder, and I'm gonna put that one up here, so you have it, and you click down on the first week. So now we should be on week one here. And if you go to that week, you will find the lecture material in terms of uh, PDF, HTML, or just a Jupyter notebook. And then you can run all these notebooks yourself. By the way, uh, sorry for going a little bit over time. I hope that's okay. Uh, when you have uh, all this material, feel free to do a Git clone. As you can see here, you can just do a clone of everything. And then you can, put, you can just copy it to your own laptops. And you see that there are many people have actually forked this repository and just use this as their own teaching material. So you should feel free to use this material as you want. Now, I wanted to say one more thing before we stop now. So if you now go down and look at the first project, there are some small things here, which we want you to look at. So if you just bypass many of these technicalities, so the first project is actually a particle moving in a harmonic oscillator potential. And one of the things you need to do then with a given trial wave function is to actually calculate the local energy. And you can do that by paper and pencil. Alternatively, you can let Mathematica do it for you. So one of the first things is actually to try to calculate the analytical expression for this local energy with the trial wave functions, which you see here, defined in the project. 
Uh, Morten, I don't, I don't yep. think I can see your... Okay, but... sorry, sorry. I, I just forgot to share now. I can stop sharing. Thanks, Oivir. Thanks. So let me just... Sometimes I, I forget to share. So if you go to the, uh, to the project, the first project, uh, the first exercise is actually a kind of paper and pencil exercise where you would take the answers for the trial wave functions and you can see that this is a kind of harmonic oscillator thing. And then you would calculate the analytical expression for the local energy. And for one particle in one dimension, it's exactly the same as the one which I showed you now. This is a useful thing to do by paper and pencil because sometimes to calculate this local energy analytically can speed up our code. Now, what we are going to discuss in much more detail and in, in during the semester here are different ways by which we can calculate this local energy. So the local energy, if you think of the Hamiltonian operator, if we go up a little bit, so the Hamiltonian operator is going to contain kinetic energy. There's going to be an external potential and there is going to be an interaction here. Now, the uh, part which is going to cause all the pain is the kinetic energy. Because when we get a more complicated trial wave function, we need to pay attention to the calculation of the second derivative. And this is also a quantity which is useful to let uh, packages like Autograd or JAX to calculate for us. Because that, if we are changing the uh, analytical uh, ansatz for the trial wave function, we then have to calculate new derivatives and we have to plug them in in the calculations. We could use symbolic manipulations to find the derivatives. But often when we use symbolic manipulation, we get an expression which is inefficient for programming. On the other hand, if we take finite difference, we will depend all the time on a given step size. And that step size uh, will introduce an error. If we use automatic differentiation, which we will come back to, that makes life so much easier for us. And it gives us much more flexibility, in particular, if we are dealing with neural networks, where we may change the parameters of the network uh, in many, many different ways. So. Uh, there are going to be compromises which we have to look at, and some of these compromises deal with how do we evaluate the local energy, and the place which we are going to spend a lot of cycles in the local energies is, as it says here, the tricky part of the derivative of the trial wave function is the calculation of the kinetic energy. And you're going to hate this exercise, I guarantee you. And when you see how easily you can let, let's say, uh, automatic differentiation deal with it, you're gonna hate this exercise even more. However, it's very useful to see how you can speed up a calculations if you have a compact analytical equation. So these are numerical considerations which we will deal with in this course here. So I'm going to stop here now. I went a little bit over time I uh, hope you can excuse me for that. I would like to suggest that we take a small break uh, and let's just say uh, we meet back at the 4.20, if that is okay, 4.20. And then Eivin is going to present the C++ framework. That will also be recorded. So you will have all these elements, the first lecture here and Eivin's presentation of the C++ framework uh, as a recording when we are done today. Uh, as I said, in the lectures and in, at the lab, we will use Python and C++. But if you want to use other languages, you should feel free to do that. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing and I'm going to pause the recording if that is okay. And then we just meet back at 4.20 and uh, feel free. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So... Hi everyone who's physically present. Um, I don't know if everyone else, if there's a, if there's anyone else, and if they can hear me well on the on the Zoom. But uh, just uh, write in the chat or something if it's if it's hard to hear me. Um, I might also walk out, walk around a little bit. So um, 
if if the sound becomes bad, just also let me know. Um, so um, what I'm gonna show you guys, I just quickly uh, demonstrate a um, a template code that you can use for project one uh, if you choose to use C++. So um, I guess Morten already said so that uh, in this course, it's recommended to use Python or C++. And then um, you can also use more or less anything else, but uh, but these are the ones that you will get uh, the most help from. So if there's any trouble, you should ask. You can, of course, ask anyways, and we could probably together find out, but uh, we know more about Python and C++. And there are some uh, good reasons to choose a compiled language as opposed to a, um, a typed language like, uh, or a runtime language like uh, Python, uh, because um, you will do a lot of uh, very basic mathematical operations and you will sort of, uh, your hierarchy and what you're trying to build is, is uh, sort of more complex on a, on a different type of scale. So it's actually easier to to just write everything in C++ and use primitive for loops. Uh, whereas if you opt for Python, you, you probably have to think a little harder on how you can vectorize it. But again, it's, it's uh, definitely doable. And a lot of students have done it with a very good success using Python. And as Morten talked about with this uh, auto auto diff for uh, this uh, automatic differentiation, that's in, way easier in Python. So that's also, I guess, a good reason to use that if you want. But <clears throat> so uh, C++ is, um, I mean, it's a kind of a huge language and it's uh, it can be a little hard to start using. Um, so uh, this template has has been really good for a lot of people to just get started and have sort of a set of structure that you can just compile, run, and sort of fill in the blanks a little bit. And then then you will have to sort of go a little off off track and and figure out stuff on your own. But but it's more it gets you started a little bit. So if you choose C plus plus, I would probably recommend to do it this way. Um, so in case you want to follow along on, uh, uh, on the webpage or you want the webpage yourself, I can just link that in the chat. It's, oops, it's, uh, this link here and, uh, oops, where is it? Where did it go? There. So here's the link. It's, uh, at this for everyone who's present, it's github.com and then mortele slash variation of Monte Carlo is for 411. Uh, and we would recommend you to just fork this repository so you can get your own uh, uh, working version of this. So let me just do that. So I would create the fork like this. I'm just gonna set this here. Yep. And then once you have forked it, you can just clone it to your uh, a local computer, like so. And the first thing uh, you should try to do, if you're on a Linux or a Mac, you can try to run this script right here. And ideally, it should have all so if you have installed uh, GCC, G++, or uh, you have Mac with CLang, then this should compile fine. Uh, and what this does is it, it creates this uh, binary file here that we can just try to run like this. And then it sort of does a very, <laughs> very short uh, Metropolis or Monte Carlo simulation uh, for you to look at. Um, and then, so where do you start? Let's see. Can you post? Okay, so the link disappeared. Uh, that wasn't it. Um, back here. There we go. Okay, so if you if you just look back to the GitHub uh, GitHub uh, repository, then you can scroll down and there is a readme that's 
uh, so that gives you some pointers to where you can start. Um, and uh, and I mean, there are just a few hints here where it's a good idea uh, to look initially. Uh, and there are some uh, information on how you can get this up and running. So uh, if you're on a Linux and if you're on a Mac, this should be fairly straightforward. Um, and if you're on a Windows, uh, this is also possible, but I'm not a uh, Windows savvy guy. So I, I, I mean, I have made it work for a lot of people on Windows, so it is possible, uh, but um, we just have to figure out like how to get the compiler and everything because it's supposed to be uh, very functioning for both uh, Windows and Mac and Linux. Um, so we can just start by having a small look into the code. And a good place to start is just go this, is to go straight into this main uh, CPP file. Um, and what this does is it sets up, uh, I mean, it defines a couple of parameters that you will get to know uh, more in the coming weeks. And it creates a, a random number generator and it sets up an initial distribution of particles, and then it makes a system. And in this code here, uh, this uses fairly modern C++ with these smart pointers and everything to avoid uh, possible memory leaks. Uh, if these can be a little daunting the first time you meet them, if if this is your first time, but but uh, they are almost like normal pointers and normal references if you're used to these. Um, so it sets up this system, it passes in a Hamiltonian, it passes in a wave function, it passes in a solver class, and then it passes in the particles that's been distributed. Then it equilibrates the system for a while before it runs uh, some metropolis or it runs the actual metropolis steps and returns a sampler that sort of outputs this uh, information on the energy and the different parts of the system. So uh, all of these different parts are fetched from uh, fetched from these different uh, header files or from these different files, and they are all located here at the top. So you can see that your particles they will be located in this uh, this part of the code, the particle CPP and particle header. Uh, your system is in these two uh, sampler are here, and then you have like the different in solvers, you have, uh, so in the solvers, you can go to this Metropolis CPP file, which is what does the actual Metropolis step. So this is where you're supposed to fill in code. So there are uh, there are a few comments here and there in the different files that sort of tells you what you're supposed to do and, and, and gives you an indication where you can find them. So this is for the how to do the Metropolis sampling. You can see also in uh, the Hamiltonian, for instance, in the harmonic oscillator. There's a comment on how here you're supposed to fill in your expression for your local energy. So as Morten talked about, um, both to access this uh, 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 Laplacian of the wave function and also uh, just the just the local the just the potential energy part of the Hamiltonian. And then also in the wave function you have different parts that you need to fill in. Um, so this is this is more more to get you more to get you started and and um, I know that uh, for a lot of people it's it's not so uh, you want to write your own code and uh, and that's good. It's a good idea and and really if you if you want to sort of set up your own system, your own structure, everything, do that. it's uh, it's a good way to sort of practice uh, and feel free to just use this as sort of a this code here as a template because it is a it is a very okay way to sort of set up this type of project um, and it has been helpful in it can also be helpful if you're going to write in Python or if you're going to write in some other language because it gives some fairly sensible ways of doing this um, but Definitely feel free to choose whichever solution you want, but this this gets you going kind of fast. 
So I think that's it for me for, unless there are any questions either in the chat or here in the crowd. <laughs> No. Okay. Then I think maybe we can stop here. And um, then uh, if you want to either get started on the project or do whatever, then feel free to do that. <laughs>